So I would like to welcome you all uh, this afternoon to CISA and the Pondering Excellence talk series. I am Suzanne Burroughs. I'm the executive director of the center. And I have the great privilege of introducing our speaker this afternoon, Lynn Zomo, who is one of our phenomenal uh, PhD doc students. Lynn is um, a very accomplished woman. She has a master's in earth science from Dartmouth and was here at Stanford getting her master's in curriculum and teacher education and is working in the field of science education. I also just learned that Lynn is really excited to have a uh, job talk interview opportunity that will be based on the content that she'll be sharing with us this afternoon. So I would very much appreciate feedback, questions. Let's get her really, really welcome here for that. <laughs> so Lynn, thank you so much. And we're just really delighted. I know I'm pushing you along, but try to wrap up in the next 10 seconds or so. And when you're done, peel your sticky off and stick it on like a name tag. 
somebody who's maybe sitting next to you or near you, them as well, mm -hmm. have a quick conversation and tell them about your sketch or whatever you wrote today. Okay. I can already tell what I drew. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little. Yes. Oh, it's one of those. It's a little. Like it. 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 Like it.
And I really want to emphasize here that I'm not showing these maps and I'm not giving you these statistics to say that one political group is better than another or one is smarter or anything along those lines. I'm not showing this to further the political divisions that we already have in this country. But what I'm showing it, why I'm showing it to you, is to show, has to do with uh, this statement from NASA, where that final sentence says that human activities are the primary driver of climate change. However, that science is disputed in the political world in the US. Science has become politicized. And in particular, the scientific consensus around climate change has become politicized. And I'm arguing that that's a major problem for science, um, and also for us as science educators and as educators in general. How we're supposed to navigate this politicized world of science when our job and our responsibility is to help young people, to help students make sense of the world in a way that aligns with the scientific community when that way is being uh, disputed by one political party in the US. So my research is founded on this idea that this politicization of science and climate science is a problem for science education. We know that for adults in the US, politics influences science, scientific reasoning about climate change. There is a huge amount of research on this that's been done in the past 10 to 20 years. What we don't know is how politics are affecting young people. There's much less research in this area. And this is a really important topic for young people because they're the ones who are going to deal with the most severe consequences of climate change. We're starting to see some signs that young people really care about climate change. We've seen a series of climate strikes over the past year where kids have walked out of school, but we need to know more. So this is the driving question of my research. What is the role of political views in scientific reasoning about climate change for you, for young people? How does politics affect the kids that you teach in school? And while this is the big question for most of my research, uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you the results of one study that I've done over the past year. And I want to emphasize that the work I'm showing you and the results I'm showing you uh, are work for myself as well as my two colleagues, Brian Donovan and Casey. Before I get into the findings from our research, I want to share with you a current debate within science education research around research that's been done on adults. And this debate is between two hypotheses, the worldview hypothesis and the knowledge hypothesis. What the worldview hypothesis says is worldview, which is a construct that we use to stand in for political stance. It's vaguely equivalent, but worldview is easier to measure uh, I'll sure talk more about that in just a minute. And the hypothesis says that worldview influences people's views of climate change. And it doesn't matter what level knowledge you have, but rather your political stance matters much, much more. In contrast, there's the knowledge hypothesis, which says that knowledge influences people's views on climate change more. So it says the more you know about climate change, the more likely you are to accept it, regardless of your politics. This is different from the worldview hypothesis that says it doesn't matter what science you know, your worldview decides how you think about it. So I want to start off by giving you some details about the worldview hypothesis. This says that worldviews and outlooks on the world, essentially your political stance predicts how you think about climate change. So worldview is measured on a spectrum. Um, and the reason we use worldview in research instead of just asking you what political party you affiliate with is because worldview is on a scale. So we see much more variation. Um, if I ask you what political party you affiliate with, typically in the US, you get a binary answer, one or the other. But with worldview, we have clicks on a scale. And the scale has been established and validated through previous research. On one end of the scale is the egalitarian, communitarian worldview. People in this, on this end of the spectrum tend to value the common good. They tend to be concerned about environmental issues because environmental issues threaten the common good. And so what follows from that is they tend to accept climate change and want to take action on reducing it. In the US, this typically aligns with a more liberal political stance. Uh, and I put the word liberal here in quotes because it's, it's not a perfect match and obviously everybody's different. Um, the term egalitarian communitarian is quite a mouthful. 
So today I'm going to be using the words of Google to represent this, but know that I understand that there are multiple perspectives embedded in that. And on a worldview scale, somebody in this group who is all the way to the left, all the way egalitarian, communitarian, looks for a war. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what's called the hierarchical individualist. People with this type of worldview tend to value individual freedoms. They tend to be skeptical of environmental risks because regulating those risks involves impinging on individual rights and freedoms. So what follows from this is that people in this group tend to be skeptical of climate change. And this is the theory of why there has been so much climate doubt and skepticism over the past decade. Um, typically, this aligns in the US with a more conservative viewpoint. So again, for brevity's sake today, I'll be using the word conservative to represent hierarchical individualists. And somebody all the way on the end of this scale would score a six on a worldview scale. I want to emphasize that worldview is a spectrum. It's a scale that ranges from one to six. So how we determine it is through a simple 12 question quiz and it uses a number for every person we give it to. So you probably fall somewhere on this scale. You can think about where you might fall. In the US, uh, worldview is relatively evenly distributed and uh, most people fall somewhere in the middle. There's another part of the worldview hypothesis. So basically, the simple aspect of the worldview hypothesis is that the more liberal you are, the more accepting you are of climate change, the more conservative you are, the more skeptical you are of climate change. That's a simple interpretation. There's another part, and that involves quantitative reasoning, or a person's ability to navigate statistics and number and um, complex scientific and mathematical reasoning. And what research has pointed to is that quantitative reasoning deepens the division between the left and the right. It deepens the division between liberals and conservatives. This graph is taken from Van Hohan's work uh, from a paper in 2012. And what I want to draw your attention to here is along the x-axis is a measure of quantitative reasoning. And I want to focus on the high quantitative reasoning group. So these are people who are very skilled at math, who adeptly navigate numbers and statistics. And this green line up top, that represents a more liberal group of people, and the blue line represents a more conservative. The y-axis is a measure of perceived risk of climate change. So basically, the higher up you are on it, the more concerned you are about climate change. And you can see that as we go up in quantitative reasoning, we get more separation between the liberals and the conservatives. So the, most, the people the most accepting of climate change are liberal, high quantitative reasoning people. The people who are the most skeptical are people who have very high quantitative reasoning skills and are conservative. Now, this doesn't seem right, right? It seems like the more skilled you are with math and numbers, the more you would align with science. But the theory behind this, what this is actually saying is it's saying people who have a comfort with numbers, who are good at quantitative reasoning, are so good at it that they are very adept at finding and pulling out the information that aligns with their ideological viewpoint. This is called ideological motivated reasoning. And it happens on both ends of the political spectrum. I want to emphasize that. But here, we're especially concerned about this because this is against the scientific consensus. It is going against what all of the scientific organizations across the world are saying about climate change. And that's a major problem. So I'm going to do a quick talk um, what do you think of the worldview hypothesis? Is this accurate based on your experience? So think about this for just a minute and maybe chat with the person next to you and I'll float around.
as far as like that assessing the plan is going to be good, but it was like so much kind of community based that I see now, I feel like more people are going to find out why that's so much of a change, right? And you said, I just put it out of evidence. Like, it's kind of sensitive. I thought just the tail end of the risk this especially the explanation not yeah, I mean, because I'm sure I do. to understand how these planes, scientific planes, were built, and if they do, is it then that they intentionally um, choose the planes that are convenient, or is it, you know, they have higher science literacy, they know more things about science, but they don't necessarily have, you know, interventions about how was uh, this knowledge uh, built, why is it legi legitimate? That is such a great question and is, is a major question that arises from this paper. And essentially the measure of science literacy and numeracy that we're using here is the ability to interpret data. Uh, and it was, it was a short measure. Um, but this has been replicated in other studies with different measures of science literacy. And it's al almost always some form of data analysis and interpretation to measure how well people do that and then give them a score. But I think you bring up a major point of is uh, antagonizing the scientific consensus on climate change, is that actually doing scientific data really? To me, it doesn't seem like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to know how many people in the conservative high literacy are physicists. Because <laughs> 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 my personal experience, sorry, I don't have anyone in the room. Because I know there's, I know it takes all kinds, but like, I've had a lot of experiences, like in terms of ecology, particularly talking about like ecological systems where, you know, like you get into like some arguments uh, with, with depending on the arguments of physicists or whatever, so you tend to want to simplify. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that number. And I would also say that I recently got into an argument with a biologist about this. So. Okay, well. <laughs> Uh, okay, you've had some chance to grapple. You've had a chance to grapple with the worldview hypothesis. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background on the knowledge hypothesis. So, this competing hypothesis of worldview. The knowledge hypothesis is what's what's been around for a long time with climate change education, where people through the '90s and early 2000s argued that this is just about education. We need to educate people on climate change, and then they'll understand and accept. It, but 
A recent addition to the knowledge hypothesis is a contribution from Randy and Clark who are over at Berkeley. And they said it's not just knowledge, but it's a particular type of knowledge. And in climate change, it's mechanistic knowledge. So understanding the mechanism that drives the causes and effects of climate change can reduce the polarization seen by worldview, seen through worldview. So the studies that uh, they did, those researchers, showed that it didn't matter what political party people affiliated with, that once they understood the mechanism of climate change, it was all good. They got it, they accepted climate change. So essentially their theory is, once people understand that when you burn fossil fuel, that releases CO2 because fossil fuels are carbon based, that CO2 goes into our atmosphere, exacerbates the greenhouse effect, leading to global temperature rise. Once people have that, they accept climate change. That's the knowledge hypothesis. So just to recap, the current debate in the research on adults around climate change education takes the worldview hypothesis, which says that your politics matter much more than anything you know, um, versus the knowledge hypothesis, which says that once you understand the mechanism of climate change, you accept climate but all of this research has been done on adults. Um, there's been very little research done on young people, on children in school. The current debate in the research on adolescents is a little thin. I found one study that looked at young people and politics and didn't use worldview, but instead used political identity and found that political identity influences climate science learning in some complex ways. And another study that shows that knowledge is important and worldview matters much less for young people. And by young people, I mean middle to high schoolers. There's a lot left to figure out. We don't really know how each of these variables, how politics, how worldview, how knowledge, are affecting young people's ideas about climate change. Um, so quick, let's, we'll do a 30 second turn and talk. What do you think? Most of you have worked with children at some point in an educational setting, and many of you have been science educators. What do you think influences kids' ideas about climate change? Is it worldview? Is it politics? Is it knowledge? Is it something else? Go ahead. Talk about that for about 32 oh. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> about how it seems like they would be influenced by like the sort of the community where they grew up like you know a lot of times children can be influenced by their peers in a lot of ways and like their parents like what are their parents views and also like where they're schooled so we we're just talking about how some students could be homeschooled and that you know I've heard of stories like parents could teach creationism right versus if they went to a different school and learned like theory of evolution for example that could have like a really big influence even if they have scientific knowledge, it's maybe dependent upon where they get that sort of education. Um, 
So context matters. Yeah. Other thoughts? I just have a question. Like, I'm wondering if there's any research that surfaced in um, like science research, like with teacher education, around whether or not the knowledge of climate science is being suppressed in schools, much like evolution, the teaching of evolution has been suppressed in some public schools, mm -hmm. my own home state, Kansas, just for example. So I'm just, I'm just curious about that. Like, is there, I know the evolution thing, it's been ongoing and there's lots of evidence of like rescinding it from textbooks and in Kansas, for example, the State Board of Education basically saying you have to teach creationism when you teach evolution side by side. Is this happening with climate change too? Uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, in most cases, I think the difference is evolution is in many ways a staple of biology, whereas climate change is new and it's not really associated with any subject in particular, and it, it gets lost in the shuffle in high school science. Where what you're talking about is happening is we see it with NGSS adoption. Um, so the states that have adopted NGSS uh, have, have typically adopted some but all of the standards. Some states have chosen not to adopt the climate standards um, or change them. So West Virginia changed the one NGSS performance expectation about uh, historic changes in the climate. Um, and they typically tend to be states like West Virginia that have relied on fossil fuel emissions. Um, so I think, I think we're starting to see that. And it, it would be an interesting thing to look at in comparison uh, to what's happened with biology education. So we don't know with this question. We don't, we don't know what's driving this idea. And this was the motivating question for the study that I'm about to show you. And I want to get into that study now. The big research question for this study that we did is how do mechanistic knowledge, worldview, and quantitative reasoning influence receptivity to human-caused climate change among adolescents? So we wanted to start shedding some light on this question of what drives kids thinking on climate change. Uh, I'll take you through the methods of this study. Can you just, can you just please say a bit more about what you mean by mechanistic knowledge? Mechanistic knowledge is understanding that burning fossil fuels releases CO2, so that, that's a cause and effect relationship. Mm -hmm. And then that CO2 adds to atmospheric CO2 and it exacerbates the greenhouse effect. So knowing more about what's behind the carbon <coughs> So methods. Uh, fortunately, we, this study was embedded in a much larger study, which meant that we had access to many, many students. And for this study in particular, we used 357 high school students ranging from 9th to 11th grade from five schools across the country. In California, two schools were in Colorado, a school in DC, and a school in Massachusetts. Across these five schools, students Participants within our study were located in 46 different science classrooms. That's a lot of science classrooms, and you're probably doing some sort of math in your head right now. And what I want to say is in a typical science classroom, only a handful of students participated in this study. The rest participated in a much larger study for relevant kids. So typically, we have five or six kids from each classroom participating in this study. Um, we gave all participants a pretest. That pretest measured worldview with that 12 question assessment I told you about earlier. So that allowed us to calculate a specific number representing worldview for each student. We also assessed quantitative reasoning through a validated instrument involving data analysis and interpretation. And we had demographics. After that, students were randomized within classrooms. So say we had five students within a classroom participating in this particular study three would go into one condition and two would go into another. And we had two conditions. These conditions were identical. They were identical computer-based NGSS aligned learning experiences that lasted approximately 45 minutes. During this experience, students analyzed temperature and precipitation data and looked at trends and learned a lot about climate change. The one difference between these variations was that in one, we taught the human mechanism of climate change, which is what correlates the research. We taught this idea that when people burn fossil fuels, that releases CO2, that exacerbates the greenhouse effect. The other condition did not have that. It had everything else that was identical. At the end, we gave students a post-test. 
And in the process, this was one of the open-ended questions that they had. So I'll read about that. Imagine that after learning about this, evidence being all the evidence for climate change, in your science class, you walk out of the stuff hallway and hear another student say, I don't think climate change is real. It's not any warmer on this day than it was last year. And anyways, the temperature is always changing. It's natural for the weather to change. What would you tell this student to help them understand that climate change is supported by scientific evidence? So now, every one of our 357 students has the opportunity to write a response to this. And we use that as data. And I'm going to show you some of that data right now. What are you showing? So Sarah is handing out just a sample of data responses from this question. There are five student responses here. And for now, uh, I'd just like you to read them. Maybe mark anything that stands out to you or that you find interesting. And while you're reading these, think about this question. Decide if this student is receptive to human-caused climate change or rejective. So which are? Yeah, it's a fact. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
process that I went through in analyzing this data. And I heard a lot of talk there, it seems like there's a definitive decision on B. Yeah, B, Bs are skeptic. Um, and interestingly, using some of the language that we see uh, skeptics in the political world using about variability and natural change. Um, so eventually, we decided to categorize each of these statements, each of these writings, as either receptive of climate change in general or rejected. Initially, it started out using the Global Warming Six Americas as an analytic framework from uh, Andrew Horowitz, who does some of the work at Yale on climate change communication. Um, but then the economic users collapsed all of these categorizations into those two categories. And I think one of the most helpful findings from this study is that 85% of these students were receptive of climate change. That's actually a much greater percentage than the, the American adult population as a whole. So I feel like this is a nice bright spot. <laughs> and this is regardless of condition? Regardless of condition, yes. Great point. So now I'm gonna show you a little bit more about what we did next with our analysis. Next, we did some statistical analysis. And to do this, we use generalized estimating equations to predict whether a student's response would be receptive. So that binary variable of receptive versus rejected. And this is uh, the first model that we built. I'm just throwing up here, don't get intimidated by it, <laughs> to show you that we were creating these models to use our different variables of condition, and whether they were exposed to the mechanism of climate change. CTR is our worldview measure, um, and quantitative reasoning, as well as several demographic variables. We, uh, variables. We wanted to see what would predict that variable of receptive. And uh, here's one uh, We ended up building six statistical models, six different es generalized estimating equations. And what we found was that this was our best model, this was our strongest model. And I want to take you through each of the variables that are significant here and show you how they relate to the different hypotheses I showed you before. So first, I'm going to point you to the treatment variable, treatment as a new condition. So this is showing that whether students were exposed to the human mechanism of climate change, and if they were, that increased receptivity. And what I want to point out here is if, if you're used, used to looking at table grade groups, this is an odds ratio. So what this is saying is that students who learned through the human mechanism condition about climate change, um, their odds of being receptive towards climate change increase nearly threefold. Uh, so that shows that, that shows some evidence towards the knowledge hypothesis that teaching the mechanism is important. However, another uh, significant variable was worldview. And what we're seeing here is that worldview influenced receptivity. And you'll notice that this odds ratio is less than one, which means that as worldview increases, receptivity to climate change decreases. And if you remember the world view scale, the high end was that hierarchical individualist conservative. So the more conservative kids were, the less likely they were to be receptive. The more liberal they were, the more likely they were to be receptive. Additionally, uh, these two variables here, the QR, the quantitative reasoning, and the interaction between quantitative reasoning and worldview, show that there was an interaction between worldview and quantitative reasoning that led to polarization. So just like we saw in our graph earlier with adults, you know, the high quantitative reasoner was farther apart than the low one, kids were replicating that behavior. So we have some interesting findings. I want to sum up these findings for you. One is that the condition map, learning about the mechanism driving climate change, made students in this study be more receptive climate change or write with language that was more receptive towards climate change. This supports the knowledge hypothesis. Knowledge matters, which is good for us as educators. It, might, it gives people knowledge. The second major finding here is about worldview. It says students with more liberal worldviews were more likely to be receptive of climate change. Those with conservative ones were more likely to be rejected. And that aligns with the political world of the adult world of the US. Additionally, there's this interaction between quantitative reasoning and worldview that ends up making it so that the high quantitative reasoning conservative students were the most likely to reject climate change of anyone in this group of students. 
whereas the high QR liberal students were the most likely to accept it. So you see that sort of extreme difference within that high quantitative reasoning category. At this point, I feel like I heard this question come up right We have evidence for both hypotheses. We have evidence for the world view hypothesis, including polarization, and we have evidence for the mechanistic knowledge hypothesis. So people are probably asking which one matters more, which one is more influential. And I can't tell you that precisely, but what I can tell you is that this variable, the variable that showed condition, explains 2% of the variance in students' receptivity, which is some percent of the variance, but it's a small percent. These two combined explain 25% of the variance. So what this is saying is it's saying that worldview explains much more of the variance than condition. But what I want you to keep in mind is that our condition, our treatment, was a 45-minute learning intervention. It wasn't a three-week unit on time exchange. So I think while people can be uh, put off or discouraged by these findings, I think there's a lot of hope here in that first finding. It's saying that education can work. Um, we have some evidence for that. So I want to dig into the text data a little bit more now. So our next step in this process is to think very, very carefully about this third finding around polarization. We wanted to understand what the high QR liberals were doing in their writing and how that differed from the reasoning that high QR conservative students were doing with their writing. So we separated students' responses out into these four categories, and we looked at the extremes in each of these four categories. So we looked at the most conservative high QR students and the most liberal high QR students, and the most liberal low QR students and the most conservative low QR students. See if there were differences in their writing. And you actually have seen some of these already. Um, so this one, B, our example B, is a very typical high quantitative reasoning conservative student in this type. Um, and here is another example from another student, right? So I'll let you think about this for a minute. I also want to show you this one, which is letter D on your sheet, and it's a very typical response from a high QR liberal student. So now, what I'd like you to do is think about D, which is high QR liberal, and think about C, which is high QR conservative, and look closely at these responses. What do you notice? How is their reasoning different across these groups? Reasoning or differences in reasoning that they saw across these groups of students. 
I'm guessing that all of them would be treated to have the opportunity to understand the distinction between what they're required. I feel that in the case of B, this is simply ignored. Yes. So that is a key part of this intervention was distinguishing between weather and climate and long-term trends versus short-term instances. And this basically changed the whole interpretation of what the charts say for him or her. Right? Yeah. What are some other things that people notice? Emily, I heard you say something. Sorry to put you on the spot, but you said something about they use the same facts. Well, so I think that very, I, what I read in this is B is talking about variability and D is also talking about variability, but they're viewing the same thing in a very different way. B is saying variability means that it's just not right at all. D is saying that variability means like that's just part of data and how I understand data. And so I feel like they're using the same thing, but they're not, they're kind of almost reasoning in the same, I see it as like a similar direction, but getting a totally different outcome. Yeah, that's super interesting. I saw that too, because they're, they're talking about variability, they're talking about statistics, but they're, they're coming to very different outcomes. It's like the, the B is focusing on like the variance that can be explained, and the B is talking about the variance that can't be explained, yeah. and like that's the two things that we're looking at. Yeah, and that, that is the essence of ideologically motivated reasoning is you find a part that supports your argument, that supports your ideological viewpoint. And people who are adept at quantitative reasoning are adept at ideologically motivated reasoning. And we're seeing that in kids, which I think is an important phenomenon to pick out. Last, this is, this is the last piece of data I'll show you. Um, I wanna show you some examples from the lower QR. And I feel like low QR maybe has a bad connotation I'm looking at it with the so they explain it better. I think these are students who just haven't developed their quantitative reasoning to the point where you know their other their peers have. Um, so this student writes, this is number for letter C on your sheet. Uh, climate change is real. There are increases in temperatures and increases in the rainfall that is occurring across the country. This cannot be a typical ideological issue. Another example from the low QR region general. Is I think this is because there are significant data showing most of the US increasing in temps over the past 100 years. Do you see differences in reasoning between these two? Differences in outcomes? I don't see a lot of difference between these two. One, one thing I think that is particularly interesting about C is that person mentions it's not a political issue. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we look at world view scores for these students, C is actually quite conservative, and uh, the other one that is unlabeled there is quite liberal. Uh, but we don't see the polarization, we don't see the difference that we saw in that high QR group. And I think that's an important thing to recognize. So what I believe this study says is this study supports both hypotheses. It supports the world view hypothesis, and it supports the knowledge hypothesis. And it supports from uh, some of the models that I didn't dwell on, it shows you that these variables act independently. So knowledge matters and worldview matter, and they act independently, except when worldview interacts with quantitative reasoning. Um, so I see evidence for both of these hypotheses. And I wanna end here. I wanna end here with my interpretations about this book. I think number one, this study is saying that education matters. And in particular, high quality science education matters. Uh, that engages students with the human cause mechanism of climate change. But the study also says that politics matter too, even for young people. And I think that's something that we brush over a lot. We rarely talk about the political identities of our young people in our schools. And we need to because it affects their reasoning and it affects their scientific reasoning. And in particular, uh, the quantitative complexities of climate, uh, climate science complicate this even further because developing quantitative reasoning, that's a major goal of science education. As science educators, we want our students to be uh, very good at quantitative reasoning 
at navigating data and statistics. But this shows that the further they are along that elevator reasoning trajectory, the more likely they are to experience polarization and ideologic motivated reasoning. And I think this is uh, a big issue for science education. So I want to end by saying we're at a really critical point, both with climate change in our natural world and with climate change education. Up to this point, there has not been much emphasis on climate science education in K-12 schools. And we're at a point where it needs to happen. And if we do it well, it could enhance young people's acceptance of the scientific consensus on climate change. But if we do it poorly, it could deepen these divisions, particularly as we help students understand the quantitative complexity, the variance of climate data. And I think that this is something that we have a lot of work to do in the next few years, both in teaching and science classrooms, and understanding what curricula work for what students, and in research, and understanding these multiple and complex influences on students' scientific reasoning. So thank you for joining me today, and we'll thank you. Super interesting. Um, so thank you. It was really engaging too. Um, I was kind of wondering, um, like, why you just focused on like quantitative reasoning as one of the sort of explanatory factors, and did you have you considered other kinds of, um, I guess, scientific knowledge? Because I feel like a lot of climate change is like systems, complex systems thinking, which is maybe partly quantitative, but there's like like a different in a different way. So I just wondered if you kind of thought about that at all as well. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, an answer to that is partially out of convenience. Um, this was part of a really massive study where quantitative reasoning was already being measured, so I just went with that. I do think specific climate knowledge is important, and uh, we did ask some of those questions, but it, it didn't turn out to be a validated scale, and it was hard to assess, so we left that off. But I think that is a great direction for where to go next. Okay, so you know I love your work. And <laughs> this is a fantastic talk, and as always. Um, but what I'm wondering about is if there was any role of the worldview uh, survey items in priming students about their worldview, and that might that might that change the way that they approach the questions at the end. That's a fantastic question, and something I didn't mention is we gave those pretests two weeks in advance of the intervention. Big key. Um, yeah. But that is an important thing. And I think other studies have shown that worldview type questions do prime and boost. Best one. Like, how did you get that many kids? <laughs> 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 I have, I have <laughs> friends in good places. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have you followed up since with, with these students? Yeah. No, unfortunately, I. I had no connection to the actual implementation of this, so I didn't even know what schools these were. <laughs> Shouldn't maybe say that, but. <laughs> no, I wish I did. More objective. True, yeah. <laughs> but they're all strange and cool, so. But I think something I would, where I would like to go next in terms of a study like this is to do a more long-term study. Mm -hmm. um, one to two to four years of understanding the evolution of kids thinking about climate change. Um, that's a key question. <coughs> So related, like, so you don't know which school, so you don't know anything about demographics of the schools or? I do know uh, basic demographics, so that SES, um, racial ethnic distribution, that sort of thing. And what about like how much, you know, climate change has maybe already been part of the curriculum or students have been exposed to it? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, there's very little exposure to climate change. We had one question on the pretest that previous classes taken, um, but it was really hard to determine any information from that one. So that's a, a great, great question. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more um, about your conclusion. So politics matter. Can science educators do something about it? Yes. Um, I think that science educators can do something about it. And I think this is where teachers 
takes working closely with teachers to understand the context of the home and to understand how kids' different forms of identity, including political identity, come up in the classroom in ways that they can help students feel like those students can be who they want to be while still engaging with science in a way that allows the science to come alive. They don't have a good answer, but I knew that it would involve working with the teachers. Yeah. Here we've talked about classroom level interventions that we might mm. support. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so all of our problems <laughs> <laughs> So one idea I've been thinking about is teaching students about ideologically motivated reasoning in uh, its forbidding view. <laughs> Just being very clear about the psychological reasons behind why we do this and helping kids understand we, we all do this. We all engage in ideologically motivated reasoning every day, um, whether we admit to it or not. <laughs> and it's a matter of figuring out what we're doing it about and why and why we're picking the reasons kids navigate that I think would be huge. Uh, how to help kids navigate that is something I hope to spend the next several years working on. <laughs> I have a question. We were just talking about, you, had, you posed a question about, um, I can't remember. Basically what I'm really trying to say is like they have their world view. We were sort of talking about influencers and social media. So I'm thinking about Greta, and I'm thinking about um, those students where um, in light of uh, student-led kinds of marches and their concerns about um, climate change, how, how do they, and because we're looking at youth and, and my peers may be more important than my parents' ideologies or whatever, but I am curious to see how the rise of student um, political action in really major kinds of ways, under major kinds of circumstances, can influence some of that political worldview. Yeah. Um, and how does that play out in the classroom where, you know, Sarah asked a question about what can we do as teachers? Well, one of the things that we need to also think about are the social influencers um, that those kids are listening to, or, or how does that play out? And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I feel like Sharon is asking you a big question of uh, the study that I'm doing next that I already have the data for, where I was embedded in classrooms and taking video of kids engaging in discourse. Um, and I think this is how I've been thinking about it. So worldview is this very psychological myth. It gives every person a number, which I'm not, not totally on board with. Um, but that worldview comes from somewhere, and it's constantly shifting. I don't think people are a 1.2 on the worldview scale for life. Where they are depends on their social and cultural context. So if their social and cultural context is a school where activism is huge and where kids are really into climate strikes and really motivated to act politically on this, I believe that that will shift their worldview. Um, and we'd see that outcome as the worldview number would actually shift. Um, and I think, I think those two things are constantly at play. So I think kids are constantly, just like we as adults, are constantly influenced by their surroundings and who's around them and the ideas that are around them. And they're constantly making sense of this world. So I think it's a, in some ways that makes it really hard to study because it shifts all the time. You know, if you think about a year ago, climate activism wasn't really a thing for most young people in the US. But in the past six months, it's really taken off. So I think, I think there's a lot of interesting interplay there. I think that's a very interesting, and it might point to the fact that the convention that involves psychosocial um, opportuni uh, opportunities for students to express themselves, uh, opportunities for students to be able to critique and, and explain why uh, things um, seem coherent to them or not, etc. Might, might be interested, the more I'm working on similar work, the more I feel like psychology and sociology and the yeah. meeting of the two are really relevant to, to understand how this is happening and really connect this to science education. 